I finally get to use my favourite adaptational catchphrase. <coughs> Dear the creators of the Percy Jackson and the Olympians The Lightning Thief movie, if you want to tell the author's story, tell the author's story. If you want to tell your own story, tell your own story. Don't take the author's story and try and turn it into your story, you jackasses. and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation. I joined the Percy Jackson party a little bit later in life than the intended age bracket, but I still thoroughly enjoyed them. They really appealed to my interest in Greek mythology. I can't quite put my finger on how, but I really feel like the author captured the slightly alien yet somehow human nature of the ancient Greek gods. He also didn't fall into the usual trap of assuming that just because Hades was the lord of the underworld, and because the other gods treated him like shit, that he was an evil person, or getting him mixed up with Satan. Most importantly, the books don't talk down to the reader, even though they're intended for a young audience. And then you have the film. There's three types of changes that commonly appear in film adaptations. There's the changes that have to be made, the changes that you can get away with making, and the changes that spit in the face of the book and show that you completely missed the point or didn't care in the first place. In this particular film you can't go five minutes without getting hit in the face with all three. Just in case you haven't picked up on it yet, it's my philosophy to not take sequels into account in these reviews unless I absolutely have to. It's not fair to the film if you judge it for not including something that was introduced in the books later in the sequels, and it also doesn't excuse a film for not including something because they put it in a later movie. Sea of Monsters will have its turn. This is The Lightning Thief, nothing else. Okay, now that the disclaimers are out of the way. The concept of Camp Half-Blood, the bastard children of gods and mortals being brought together to keep them safe and to train them in the ways of heroing, is in both book and film. They also kept at least some of the plot. Zeus's thunderbolt is stolen and everyone suspects Percy, the son of Poseidon, because it was standard procedure for gods to get their offspring to do their dirty work for them. All of the gods gear up for war, each blaming one of the others for the theft, and Percy and two of his friends have to track it down and bring it back to Zeus before the summer solstice and the very last peace talk. His quest ends up taking him to the underworld and eventually to Mount Olympus, which has been relocated to the top of the Empire State Building because the gods like to move around every century or so and attach themselves to whichever country is currently the most prosperous. Despite being tricked into carrying the bolt around with him, Percy manages to bring it back to Zeus just in time to stop the War of the Gods. Other than this, you have to look pretty hard to find anything else they didn't mess around with. The film held true to the idea that a side effect of Percy's mixed species heritage partly manifests itself as several attention and learning disabilities like ADHD and dyslexia. Speaking as someone who's been plagued his whole life with ridiculously inconvenient dyslexia, I was pleased to see someone attempt to visualise its effects and the frustration and embarrassment it can lead to. On his way to Camp Half-Blood, Percy and his mum are attacked by the Minotaur, no I'm not pronouncing that wrong, and his mother is taken to the underworld as a hostage by Hades just before Percy kills it with its own horn. And well gosh, I think that's pretty much it. Everything else is just one big clusterfuck of changes and omissions. Oh boy. There are so many of these, I'm going to have to divide this section up into subcategories. The pearls used to escape the underworld were a gift from Poseidon delivered to Percy by a messenger. They required no work whatsoever to obtain. Why the hell did they feel the need to make the search for the pearls such a huge part of the movie? There was already a perfectly good plot for them to follow. They still visited places like Medusa's Garden Emporium and the Lotus Casino, but that was because they just happened to stumble into them by chance. What's that you say? But Dom, you gorgeous genius, isn't it better that they try to tie these things into the plot rather than just having them unrealistically walking into them by happenstance? Well, yes. And no. That was almost the whole point. In many Greek stories like the Odyssey and Theseus and the Minotaur, the heroes constantly ran into one completely random encounter with a weird monster after another. Having it happen in a modern setting was a clever nod to this. The film kind of missed a trick here. Seemingly unimportant at first glance, Mrs. Dodds is Percy's maths teacher in the book, not his English teacher. The reason I give a fuck is because the very first chapter is amusingly named I accidentally vaporized my pre-algebra teacher, so there's no way in hell they could have missed this detail. Their blatant ignoring of this is, I think, 
a very clear fuck you book, we don't give a shit statement right at the start of the film. In keeping with this attitude, they cut out the part where Percy uses his sword pen to cut Mrs. Dodds in half, causing her to disintegrate and reconstitute later in the story. That was one of the things in the books, the monsters were immortal. If you killed one, its spirit would go to the underworld, but it would eventually recorporealize back in the real world, albeit sometimes decades later. By the way, the idea of magically disguising your weapon as an everyday household object may seem clever right up until the moment you accidentally leave it on your desk. Percy, I'm just borrowing your pen for a second. The book's deeper understanding of the fundamental nature of ancient Greek deities is not, alas, carried well into the film. They talk and act like normal human people, no unusual behaviour, no sense of regal presence. That Poseidon was Percy's father, a plot point given away in the movie's opening scene, was actually a big reveal a good way into the book. A lot of people knew that he was a half-blood, and some people suspected that he might be the son of one of the big three, but most just assumed he was a son of Zeus because Zeus was such a notorious poonhound. They made Poseidon a tortured, loving father who desperately desperately wanted to be there for Percy, but was forbidden from doing so. In the book, there was no such law. Each god was free to interact with his children as much as he or she wanted. Percy and Poseidon's interactions were… interesting in the book. There was an uncomfortable formality born of their years apart, and Poseidon had the extreme aloofness and self-confidence you would expect from an all-powerful being. There was just a tiny hint of his affections for Percy and his pride in him, although he kind of spoils this by straight up saying he doesn't know what to make of Percy, and telling him he regrets siring him because of the hard life he must now lead as a hero. The book describes how all the gods, with the possible exceptions of Zeus and Hades, updated their appearance over time. Dionysus now wears a tiger print Hawaiian shirt, Ares looks like one of Hell's angels on steroids with two fiery pits for eyes, and Charon has developed a thing for expensive Italian suits. The film did this a little bit at the beginning, then dispatched it all together, putting everyone in armour and togas from then on, perhaps fearing that you might not get that the giant dudes hanging out in Olympus were Greek gods otherwise. Annabeth and Percy were meant to be on the same team. She uses him as bait to distract the red team while Luke went and got the flag. It was sort of a bonding moment, but also showed how ruthless she could be. The Sons of Ares were predominantly the Daughters of Ares in the book big, tough young girls that could beat the living shit out of you without having to expend much effort doing so. I'm not sure if them changing this is indicative of sexism or just their total lack of respect for the original story. They did the usual thing where they add on a few years to the characters so they don't have to work with children. I can't really begrudge them this as good child actors are few and far between and they're a nightmare to work with. Oh yeah. Uh, oh dear. Uh, oh no 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 no. Grover got a change of ethnicity in the film and a complete personality makeover. A awkward, nervous young man is given a good helping of self-confidence and attitude. It's bad for adaptation points, but his humour is probably one of the few redeeming features of the film. What's way more offensive was small things like him freaking out at seeing the rats. Satyrs are meant to be lovers of all animals. It's tiny mistakes like this that really break a character in my opinion. It's interesting to know that the word demigod isn't used in the book, preferring the word half-blood to describe Percy and the other divine offspring. This is probably because in the Greek mythology it's more of a general term for supernatural beings, not necessarily just the children of the gods. There's no cheap knockoff of the Marauderers map in the book. They were fine with the concept that you could just tell someone where to go. In the book, the Lotus Hotel could keep someone enthralled just by being so super crazy awesome. The film took it upon itself to add in the LSD flower cakes. I don't know if this is meant to be an anti-drug message or just another example of dumbing down the plot. The entrance to the underworld was the lobby of a building in the book, not the Hollywood sign. There's tons of spirits hanging around who weren't given coins for the boatman when they died. There's actually a really funny joke they missed out on where Kyron mentions it's possible to add the cost of your trip to the underworld to your last cable bill. They kind of downgraded Zeus's lightning bolt in the film. Forget blowing chunks off the Empire State Building, that thing was meant to have the destructive power of a nuclear carpet bombing. Nobody dared take it out of its case in the book. Book. The post-credits joke where Gabe finally gets his comeuppance went down a little differently in the book's epilogue. Percy's mother intentionally uses Medusa's head to murder him, and then she sells his petrified body as art as revenge for his years of domestic violence. Wow, that was a surprisingly dark twist to the end of the book now that I think about it. Chiron actually gives Percy the quest to go to the underworld. I guess the film just felt it couldn't live without an act of teenage defiance in its plot. In the film, they took Medusa's head along with them on their quest, so... 
I don't know, hijinks could happen. In the book, Percy instead chooses to mail it to Olympus as a big old fuck you guys message. Apparently, it was more important to them to rip off Clash of the Titans than stick to the novel. The Hydra was, ironically enough, one of the few mythical beasts that didn't feature in the book at all. Everything involved in the whole Parthenon segment is strictly film only. And come on, is there anyone out there who doesn't know about the whole Hydra head regrowing thing? It's virtually common knowledge at this point. It was in a damn Disney movie for Pete's sake. Will you forget the head slicing thing? Does the film really have to treat us like we're this stupid? In the book, Percy couldn't wear the winged shoes because Zeus, the Lord of the Skies, had it out for him and any type of flying would have given him all the excuse he needed to reduce Percy to a pile of smouldering ashes. As a result, it was Grover who wore them for the entire quest and that was actually an important plot point because it's ultimately what caused Luke's plan to fail. Hey, remember when I said the book was clever enough to not get Hades and Satan mixed up? Oh boy. I wasn't sure if the debris that they were sailing through on the way to the underworld was like a zero gravity river Styx. If it was, that was kinda clever. If not, where was the river Styx, you assholes? They changed Cerberus, the famously huge and three-headed dog and guardian of the underworld, into three separate dogs which they referred to as hellhounds. Wait, Persephone was there during summer? Well that's not accurate to the book or the Greek legend. This is really starting to piss me off. It also drove me mad that they kept referring to the underworld as hell in the film. That's bullshit. I'm not arguing semantics here. In the ancient Greek religion and in the Lightning Thief book, the underworld is divided up into three sections. One great, one kinda like Limbo, and one kinda shitty. In the film, they just decide to go with the Christian hell because why stay true to the story when you can make shitty jokes all the way through the movie? What will you do? I'm already in hell. In the book, Percy describes Hades as being the first god that he has encountered that actually looked godlike. Robed in silk, a crown of braided gold resting on albino white skin with jet black hair, radiating grace yet dangerous power atop a throne fused of human bones. Welcome. Do you think I'm an idiot? I'm Hades! I'm Hades! I'm Hades! I'm Hades! When I started doing these reviews, I promised myself I wasn't going to go on long screaming tirades and just turn myself into a cheap knockoff of more talented producers. After what happened in Dune, I made sure I was prepared in case this kind of thing happened again. Reginald, engage the calm intellectual filter. Quite frankly, I do not care for this adaptational choice as I feel they intentionally insulted the source material in an attempt to obtain a rather cheap and pointless laugh at the expense of what should have been a very intimidating and serious character. This joke fails to be amusing enough for this to have been worth it. I'm curious to know who is responsible for the screenplay for this movie. Goodness me, it's Craig Tidley, the gentleman who is most famous for the questionable decisions made in the live-action Scooby-Doo movie. Mr. Tidley, I'm sure you're a very pleasant person, but I rather think you are ill-suited for your current profession. Perhaps it is time to consider a change of career. Reginald, I believe I have calmed down enough that I no longer require the calm intellectual filter. So just switch it off, you stupid clone butler. There's like a million other things changed, but this section's long enough already, so let's take a look at... Where the fuck was Kronos? They left out the setup for the main villain of the entire series? Breaking my own rule here, I will say that I know he appears in the sequel, but that doesn't fucking matter. He should be in this film. But no, the villain of the whole movie was just a kid with daddy issues. And where the fuck was Ares, the other main antagonist? They actually started the diner scene where he turns up and I was all, okay, here we go. Wait, that's the end of the scene? Guys, go back, you forgot to meet Ares! It's like they filmed in that location just to taunt us! Hey guys, you remember this bit of the book? Well, fuck you, we're not doing it. The climactic battle at the end is meant to be between Percy and Ares, which Percy wins against all the odds because he's getting a power-up from standing in the sea. But no, it's just a fight between him and a kid with daddy issues. Luke only reveals his betrayal in the final chapter. He fools everyone and gets away scot-free at the end to continue his quest to free Kronos. His motivation is primarily that his mind has been invaded and corrupted by the King Titan. Kronos played on Luke's frustration that he is being held in Camp Half-Blood permanently for his own protection. 
But nope, he's just a kid with daddy issues. Kyron the Centaur is a teacher at Camp Half-Blood, but he's not in charge there. The camp is run by Dionysus, god of wine and partying, who's currently working his way through a 100-year banishment from Mount Olympus for getting jiggy with some nymphs that Zeus had declared out of bounds. He's also being forced to spend this time in a state of strict sobriety, so he's in a perpetual mood of grumpiness throughout. Even the characters that did make it into the film had their backstories confiscated and not returned. They ignored Annabeth's troubled past with her detached father and resentful stepmother, Kyron's millennia of teaching heroes heroes, and how he became immortal, and Grover's ultimate goal of tracking down Pan, the missing god of nature, so he can undo mankind's pollution of the Earth. They attempt to replace the latter with the possibility that Grover will be awarded horns in a setup reminiscent of the angel wings in It's a Wonderful Life. In the book, satyrs just grow their own horns because, you know, they're a body part? There are several other random monster attacks and traps on the way to the underworld in the book, including a fight with the Chimera at the top of the Gateway Arch and a deadly waterbed shop, which sounds silly but was actually kind of horrifying. They also left out Annabeth's invisibility helm, a gift from her mother which has taken the form of a Yankees cap due to the effects of the mist. The mist being the name for the ever-present magic that overwrites mortals' memories of seeing supernatural things. Lastly, it's a bit of a disappointment that they didn't include the Oracle, a creepy fog-like being that lives inside an attic inside a mummified body it occasionally animates and gives people confusing hints about their future. The Dom's final thoughts. I know this is going to sound a little bit weird, beautiful watchers, but the feeling I picked up on behind the hordes of unnecessary changes was arrogance. Like, Titley thought he could do a better job of writing the story than the author, even though the book was a bestseller, and his only past accomplishment was completely ballsing up a live-action version of a cartoon show. That's why this film sucked, and that's why it can kiss its reputation goodbye. Reginald, I didn't ask you to switch the calm intellectual filter back on, so please disengage it. Reginald, while I respect your choice to ignore my request, considering my current state of agitation, there's a small chance this situation may lead to violence. Goodbye, beautiful watchers. I will see you next time. This is as far as I go. I will go this far, and no further. <coughs>